everyone and welcome to this lesson on Swallow the Air. Now this video is going to be relevant if you're studying your area of study for belonging and it's aimed at Year 12 ESL students. So in this video today we're going to be looking at the text Swallow the Air in a lot of contextual detail and then also examining the way in which you can use this text to your advantage in an essay question. So when we're considering how to understand this text, it definitely seems on the surface to be quite a dense one. It's one which is a bit complicated, especially in its language. So that's something which we're really going to need to work through. Now, if we examine these steps to understanding your text, you'll see that the first step is a plot summary. Secondly, an examination of who the author is and how her own context has influenced the production of this work. Then we'll be looking at the historical context, which is relevant to this work. We'll also be looking at an analysis of techniques. So here's where we're really going to be looking at language specific examples and taking a look at the way in which um, the author uses different language techniques to create a really poetic um, novel work. We'll also be looking at belonging themes and ideas. So this is where we'll be bringing it back to your area of study and really examining and tracing the specific ways themes about belonging can be seen in this text. We'll also be looking at reviews and critics' ideas about this work to add that extra layer of sophistication to the essays which you can produce and really to get a second opinion on how this text is constructed and what it has to say about belonging. So let's begin by looking at a plot summary of this work. Now obviously, once you're reading a novel, the plot isn't the most important when you're writing your essay. The most important things are really going to be your understanding of the language, the themes, and the characters. However, having this basic plot summary is going to be really useful for you just to get used to the ideas of this text, especially because it's a little bit complicated. So basically what happens is, May's mother, who is head sick, so this is suggestive of some sort of mental illness perhaps, dies suddenly. So May and her brother Billy are taken in by this figure called Auntie. And basically what happens is they're taken from their dead mother and taken in by this friendly, well-meaning aunt figure. Auntie brings them to the block. Now the block becomes the central setting of this um, story and it's something we're going to look at in detail in a minute. But the block is a place in Redfern where the Aboriginal community congregates. So we're going to be looking at what that means for Aboriginal identity a little bit later in this video. Life becomes more difficult for May and Billy when Auntie wins a grocery grab. So literally she wins a competition where she's grabbed groceries and has been declared the winner through collecting the most. And as a result she has money to buy alcohol. Um, and this leads to some quite detrimental problems for this family. Um, uh, the auntie then soon lapses into alcoholism and this definitely leads to the alienation of May and Billy. So this is where you start getting some of those belonging themes coming through. You are dealing with issues such as alienation and isolation within that family unit. So what seemed to be very strong before is now being broken down by this um, alcoholism. Billy also begins the self-destructive path that the block um, shows him through falling victim to drugs and gangs. So Billy um, really falls into this disadvantaged lifestyle and things like crime and addiction are really detrimenting Billy's life. May also briefly falls into this. She's sort of um, experimenting with this lifestyle but decides that it's not the lifestyle for her and she thinks that there's more out there for her. So what she does is goes walkabout. So literally what she does is leaves the block, leaves Redfern, to find her sense of self and Aboriginality, literally through trying to walk across Australia. And her aim is that as she walks across the country, she's going to come to an understanding of who she is as a person and also who she is as an Indigenous Australian. May's journey takes her from the east coast to the far north. So she's walking um, sort of diagonally up across Australia and that very extensive long journey which she's doing through hitchhiking, public transport, walking is really one which, although it's hard, makes her realise really who she is as a person. And we're going to be looking at that idea that belonging is a search and a journey a bit later on in this video.
She seeks clarification from the people she meets about what it means to be Aboriginal. So really what May's doing is meeting people, drawing resources from them and listening to what they have to say. Ultimately, however, her meeting with her uncle causes her to realise that she must take control of her own destiny. Pretty much what her uncle says to her is, when I was young, I wasn't allowed to be an Aboriginal and that was um, a factor oppressed within me. And what May realises is that as a member of this new generation, it's up to her to stand up about her Aboriginality and really appreciate that amazing culture which she's a part of. So now we're going to be taking a look at the author of this novel, Swallow the Air, and the author of this work is Tara June Winch. Now, um, this is actually her first novel which she produced, and you can definitely see that in the way that she writes, and we'll be looking at it um, a little bit later in the video. Um, Tara June Winch was born in Wollongong, New South Wales, so she was actually born in Australia, and that's definitely reflected by her very Australian focus. She is um, Wiradjuri, Afghan and English of heritage. So she has this very multicultural mix. She has Aboriginal in her, she's got um, a sort of Middle Eastern background and then she also has the traditional sort of WASP Australian culture. So this sort of way in which three cultures are meeting for her is obviously going to influence the way she deals with culture in her text. She currently lives in New York City after an internship with the United Nations. She also has a charity which promotes female empowerment and that's called 1000. So this idea of female empowerment and what it means to be a woman is something which is also really explored in this work and which we'll be examining today. So now let's take a look at understanding your text. As we've discussed, understanding the context of your text is really vital to understanding what it actually means. So Aboriginal oppression is a dark area of Australia's history and if you've watched some of our earlier videos you um, might have a bit of background about that Aboriginal oppression. However we're just going to go over that context so you really understand the way in which the way Aboriginal people are treated influences literature which is produced about them. So this book also focuses on the modern struggle of the Aboriginal people. So we're not just looking at the way in which they've struggled in history, but the way in which they, um, sort of as a collective, are sort of struggling in modern society. If we take a look at this quote from the author Tara June Winch, we see that, I am writing first for my people. My father was made to disown his identity. My generation is lucky to be able to speak. So basically what this quote is telling us is that so much of this, um, this work is based on Tara June Winch's own experience. Because what we're seeing is the relationship between Tara and May is quite a similar experience. What she's realising as an Aboriginal of um, these current generations is that she should really take a stand, spread the history of her people and not um, have this Aboriginality oppressed out of her as was seen in her father's generation in um, the author's case or in May's uncle's generation um, in the case of the novel. So let's take a look at some historical and cultural background about Aboriginal people in Australia and then just have a look at the way in which we can apply that to this novel. So in 68,000 BC, that's when the Aboriginal culture really began in Australia. Basically the Aboriginal people came to Australia and that's where they built um, their settlement which would then last for thousands of years. They're actually the oldest living culture in the world um, and it's definitely a culture which is often forgotten and not really thought about um, throughout the rest of the world. However, it's really a very ancient one with a lot of traditions which are extremely interesting to learn about. Um, within Aboriginal Australia, over 600 nations existed and this included diverse language and also culture. So we're not just generalising and thinking about one country, say like Australia today, but we're looking at all the different tribes and nations which made up the big picture of what Australia stood for at that point in time. The Aboriginal people were semi-nomadic hunters and gatherers. So what this means is they didn't have um, sort of a set place where they lived. They didn't necessarily have houses or stables or fences or anything to mark out their land. 
Instead, um, they would roam the earth and sort of really take advantage of what the earth offered to humans, gathering for food and also hunting food, which they needed to survive. So this core belief in the kinship and the dreaming was um, extremely important to Aboriginal culture. Especially this interaction between humans and the land is something which is definitely relevant to the ancient Aboriginals but which you can also trace in um, this modern work and we're going to be looking at how that relates to belonging a little bit later. Land was considered to be spiritually alive and all animals and people were part of it. So again, we have that really solid relationship between people's land and animals as well. This idea also of the verbal history in paintings um, as an expression of storytelling. So there really wasn't a form of Aboriginal literature. The Aboriginal tribes didn't write down with a notepad and pen and sort of write down their stories. They actually told it through word of mouth. So, you know, um, the mother tells her child, then the child tells her child, and then it sort of continues um, as a path like that. So it's not until really the modern day when authors such as Tara June Winch are really telling the Aboriginal story through literature. So um, this work is quite groundbreaking as a member of this new genre where the Aboriginal story is really being expressed. If we take a look at the period of the 1800s, Governor Burke declared that no one owned the land before British settlement. So this is definitely quite a culturally ignorant um, notion. Basically the idea of the white people that no one else owned Australia except for them and the Aboriginal people didn't have a right to the land which they've obviously had for thousands of years. This concept became known as terra nullius. Now basically this in Latin means the land belonging to no one. So the British saw the fact that there were no houses and fences and stables and things like that as a clue to the fact that no one owned this land and that it was free for the taking. So we know now that that's not true but that was their perception at the time. The Aboriginal population was culled to about a quarter of its size and that was through um, the deliberate introduction of diseases to Aboriginal populations which they had no immunity to and also introducing things like alcoholism in an attempt to really cull back that population. So some really nasty stuff happening at this time. If we look at the 1950s, now this is definitely probably the most famous period in Aboriginal history and it's something which if you've um, had anything to do with other texts about Aboriginals you probably would have come across. Now the assimilation policy was introduced at this time. Basically the idea that um, Aboriginality could be bred out and the white culture become um, to reign over Australia. So Aboriginal children were seized by the government and taken away to be brought up um, as white, as little white children who rejected their Aboriginality. And this um, entire concept has become known as the Stolen Generation because basically the idea behind this was that so many children were taken from their homes that an entire generation of the Aboriginal people was um, really wiped out in that their culture um, isn't um, ingrained in them just simply because they've been separated from their ancestral lands, from their family, from that connection which they share with the environment. More recently, um, if you look at the 1970s, Gough Whitlam set up the Aboriginal Affairs Agency. So that was a more positive step, however certainly not one which solved all of the problems. In the 1990s, there was a focus on restoring land to the Aboriginal people. So this idea of land rights was becoming recognised. If you take a look at the Mabo case, you'll see that for the first time Aboriginal people were trying to claim back their land and prove that they actually did have a right to the land. Um, very recently, in 12 February 2008, the apology to the Stolen Generation was made by Kevin Rudd. So um, that was the, sort of the final step in saying that Australians recognise the wrongs of this policy and trying to really right this um, very racist and culturally oppressive situation. This was a recognition of the fact that tradition had been broken and that there was a high degree of cultural trauma for this generation who was ripped away from their families. However, the struggle of the Aboriginal people doesn't just stop in the past. As I've said, this novel is set in the present, so it's also really important that you understand um, sort of Aboriginal culture today.
And while it's really important that we don't generalise um, about sort of the Aboriginals as a sort of collective group, um, these statistics just kind of show the way in which the Aboriginal people are sadly really disadvantaged um, in our community. So if we look at some statistics, um, Aboriginal people traditionally have poor living conditions and this is particularly indicated through um, widespread poverty, so traditionally low income um, and also the concept of squatting where um, they're living in houses which don't actually belong to them. Um, according to the um, Australian health organisations, Aboriginal people actually have a lower life expectancy um, and this is probably due to the fact that, as we discussed earlier, the Aboriginal people were less immune to these European diseases which were being brought across and also just these sort of overall living standards which are culminating in um, a lower life expectancy and also the fact that often um, remote Aboriginal communities will have less access to healthcare. So as, um, as we've said, there's a higher incidence of diseases in this culture. There's also a higher rate of infant mortality, so babies who die at birth or um, die while the mother's still pregnant, and also teenage pregnancy. So these are quite um, big, important issues which are really quite sadly um, neglected by the, um, by the government and are quite sadly still very obvious in the Aboriginal community via statistics. There's also high unemployment, homelessness and jail rates among the Aboriginal population. If we take a look at the idea of Redfern, now Redfern is a suburb in Sydney um, and it's known for its high Aboriginal population. Specifically within Redfern there's literally a block of land called The Block which has traditionally been a place for the Aboriginal community to congregate and has offered really quite a positive space for um, that community to meet together. Um, the Block was the first Aboriginal housing company and what that did was to provide accommodation for the Aboriginal people. So basically what that meant is that Aboriginal people who were suffering, who didn't have a home, could go to this place called The Block and really find a sense of community um, and also some housing. So just like the government offers housing um, to people who are disadvantaged, this was a very similar sort of policy. Problems surrounding the alcohol and drug trade, however, um, began to infiltrate this place because it was really picked on by the wider community and victimised through things like um, the gangs which are experienced in this novel. So it really became a place that had a lot of struggles, even though it was traditionally a positive place, it also became a place of hardship. Finally, it's also a place of cultural significance. It's definitely a place where because there are Aboriginal people, they're able to congregate together and really continue those really important traditions of the Aboriginal people. It also became a meeting place where Aboriginal people could come together. So this brings us to the end of part one of this three-part video on this novel. In this episode, we've basically looked at the background and the plot summary to this novel. And if you join us just a moment in part two, we'll be examining the way in which you can trace belonging in this work.